Good morning, and let me welcome you to the Crossings Church on this Sunday morning. If you happen to be visiting with us, we're really thrilled that you're here, and we pray that this will be a service that makes a difference in more than just the next four hours uh, that you'll be here. Uh, that's a bit of a joke, okay? But uh, we really are glad you're here, and, and we believe that the, the Sunday morning assembly was designed to launch us into a week lived for Jesus and into a life that was lived for Jesus. Before I jump into the lesson, a couple of things I want to remind you guys of. First of all, to my right is a Christmas tree, and it is our New Heights Christmas tree. Every Wednesday evening, we have buses that go into both the Heights and the Valley and some other, some of the more broken down neighborhoods in our community. And we pick up around 60 to 80 kids, 90 kids some weeks, I think, for a tutoring and mentoring program. And we invest that time and the people in that ministry do a great job. And, and several of those kids are here today. Some of them were at first service. Some of them are on a church plant that we sent out a few months ago that God has made a difference in. Uh, many of those kids will not have Christmas if we don't do something, and they are our kids. Uh, I grew up in a church, or at least when I was in school for ministry, we had a bus ministry, and they would talk about the bus kids. But there was a distinction. It was like you had the church kids that were ours and the bus kids that were whoever. And one of the things that we want to make sure that, that, the, that the kids in our Heights ministry know is they are our kids. And those words are really hollow and meaningless unless we are doing something to treat them like they are our kids. And picking up the bus, driving the bus, and all the time that our workers invest in loving them is one way, but there's a way that as a church that we can let them know how much we care for them and how much we long for them to have a life that's different than they've experienced and to break cycles and to live for the glory of God. And that's by just simply investing in a Christmas gift for one of those children who might not get one other way. Otherwise, so on that tree, there are some names with an age group that you can pick out. There's not names, there's an age group uh, and, a, and a gender uh, specification that you can pick out. And you can bring that back and there'll be a big New Heights party. I think there may some, be some information on the back of the bulletin, but we have a big wrapping party to where uh, we wrap the, the gifts for the, for the kids. And there's a all year long, they've been uh, earning points and they come down and they get to buy Christmas presents with their points for their, for their parents. And we want that to be an incredible, joyous celebration. So let me encourage you to make sure that, that you, again, let those children know uh, that, they are, that you love them. And even if they don't know a name when they get that, they'll know it's from the church that cares and doesn't just send buses they, that we care. Secondly, before we jump in the lesson, anytime someone surrenders their life to Christ in baptism, because of their faith, uh, we want to recognize that they have been born again, and we want to recognize them as a member of our family. Because family members will function a lot like their older family members. For some of us, that's scary, honestly. Uh, but for me, the scariest thing about that being spiritually true is I've watched it in other ministries I've been a part of and places where I go and speak. And it is terrifying to think about a new excited believer then becoming this lethargic believer who doesn't really prioritize and doesn't care. And the only way I know that you, can, that you can keep that from happening, or one of the most significant ways, is to make sure that you as an older brother or sister are walking with Jesus the way that they can follow in your steps. And so every time we announce this, I say that, and it's not cliche, and I know I wish I could come up with some new and better way, but they can't break the dysfunction that Satan will throw in there if you're not being functional as a believer. And don't do damage to the new believers simply by walking in a way that doesn't give them an example of how to stay close to Christ. So we want to celebrate that as the angels are. This week, Janet Spangler became a Christian. <laughs> Welcome to the family, and Janet. And uh, the, the, we always recognize the people who study with them, and it was Michelle, who is somewhere around here. Where's Michelle? She's right back there. And Summer uh, Black, boy, your teacher didn't set a very good example. She's not even here. I wonder why. A actually, they had a baby. You know, we've been praying for the baby. I think after three miscarriages, that, that they made it. And I know that she's excited about that new birth, but she's also excited about you yeah, being a member of the family. You have this already? Two weeks in. Oh, all righty. Two weeks in. Awesome. Then that's okay. Welcome to the family. We just get to keep this. I'll sell this and buy Christmas gifts. Okay. Inside of your worship bulletin, there's a set of notes that highlight the series that we're in right now. And if you want to pull that out, you'll be able to follow along with me in just a bit. In 1914, something happened that uh, when I read the story, 
I thought it might be one of those preacher stories, you know, those stories that you go, okay, that's a great story that makes a point. The problem is it's just not true. I was listening to a sermon the other day with my wife, and the guy began to tell this story about something that happened, and I turned to my wife and said, this isn't true. Uh, This guy gave a date of it happening with the Chicago Bears about 30 years ago. The problem is this story has been around for 50 years at least. So I said, this story seems so uh, improbable that I thought, man, I got a fact checked. And so I got on, and from anywhere from PBS to the British Broadcasting Network to a thousand other sources, they verify in great great detail the truth of the story. It was 1914, and it was in the middle of World War I. And you had hardened German soldiers who were living in the dreaded trenches that World War II, World War I was fought in. Winter had begun. It was cold, and they were about to encounter the most hostile battle and the most hostile war that the world's ever known. Yet despite the pain of the cold, the wind, the rain, the inclement weather, despite the barbed wire, the landmines, the machine guns, and the deadly poisonous gas, on the evening of December 24th, 1914, with, a, there, with the German forces entrenched on one side of the field and the Allied forces, including those from the states, entrenched, the Allied forces begin to hear a noise coming from the trenches of the German side that was strange. They immediately begin to listen. They could not understand the language. None of them in that particular trench spoke German. But the more they listened, as the noise got a little bit louder, they began to recognize what was going on. They didn't hear the noise, but with the universal language of music, they understood that it was a German soldier singing Silent Night. They sat and listened for a while. And then the American soldiers and the English soldiers began to join in at a break, and initially it became sort of a competition to where one would sing a verse and it would be loud, and then the next one would sing a verse and it would be louder. But the competition dissolved whenever they came to the first verse again, and both German, the enemy, depending on whose side you're on, or the English and the Americans, the enemy, began to sing Silent Night together. Before very long, some of the soldiers did something that would have been unthinkable only hours before, and that is they stood up in their trenches. To do that hours before would have been instant death. But rather than receiving fire, they looked across. And when some stood, others stood. With only a short period of, uh, within a few minutes, all of the men exited the trenches and were standing on the sides of their trench, looking over at the enemy and singing Silent Night together. For that moment, as they focused on Jesus, the war was pushed behind them and they began to approach each other. Not to destroy or to fight, but they approached and hugged. In the stories consistently revealed that not only did they hug, but they exchanged gifts. Gifts that men received from the United States, that their loved ones had sent them. Gifts of chocolate, gifts of of things to eat, gifts of bread that that were very sacred because they were from family members that they didn't know if they'd ever see, would see again became the only gifts that they had, and both sides shared those with each other. They gave the gifts, and then for a brief period of time, with the falling snow, they played a game of soccer together. Then they retreated back to their trenches, and a few hours later would begin to kill each other again. But for those moments, when the focus on Jesus Christ was greater than focus on the problems that they were facing, they experienced a peace that was amazing. As they sang Silent Night together, it became a night of peace and harmony. I was reading also that Travis Tritt, who is an old-time country singer, it took him years. Sometimes somebody asked him how, you know, how he became such a quick success, and he said there was no quick success. For years, he was playing in some of he described as the roughest bars and honky-tonks in America. He became very successful, had seven platinum albums and uh, several top ten hits. But he said one of the strangest things, he said, when those rough bars, he goes, there would regularly be fights and tables are being overturned and it would ruin the night and he couldn't do anything about it at all. He said after a few of those years, he decided he would try something different that after trying it, he'd used repeatedly every time a fight like that would break out, whether the fight broke out in, in December or whether the fight broke out in the middle of July. He and his band would begin to sing Silent Night and play it. And he said every time, without exception. The fighters would stop and look away from themselves 
began to look at the stage, and he said, on occasions, the same men that started the fights would stand there weeping as they listened to Silent Night. When the song was over, they would resume the battle, as the World War soldiers did. You see, it's amazing the kind of peace that a focus on Jesus can bring, and it really shouldn't surprise us because the very first Christmas carol that was ever sang, not by men but by angels, promised that Jesus was going to bring peace. On the top of your notes, you have Luke chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Let me begin verse 11, where this is the story that Luke reveals. The Savior, the Lord, the Messiah, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you'll recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, laying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. You see, at Christmas time, there may be a lot of stuff that you get, but if you don't get what you need most, it's a waste. There have been times whenever I've watched my kids unwrap all their presents, and there's lots of tinsel and lace, and there's lots of great presents lying around, but I know that there was something that they wanted so much that they can't celebrate, and we always have a discussion of ingratitude and how you need to appreciate what's going on, but that unwrapping and their lack of excitement is really just an illustration of how many of us are today. There are some of you here today that are going to have great Christmas. You're going to have lots of presents. You're going to have family over. You're going to do a lot of things that look like celebration, but when it's all over, you're going to look and have that emptiness that was in you before because what you wanted most, you didn't receive. In all the externals and all the things that were given and all the things that were taken and all the schedules that were kept, you didn't find something that really mattered. You're still not at peace. And maybe it's a peace within you. Maybe it's a peace with someone that you long to be reconciled. But what God wants you to know is that Christmas, when Jesus was born, he came in order to give you peace. And if you can find out how to please him, he will be able to please you with that peace. And you see, it's not about, you say, well, why do I need to please God? God wants you to please him because he wants to bless you. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me to feel better. He doesn't need you or I to act properly, to be divine, to be perfect. He's God. But what he knows is, is the more focused that I am on pleasing him, the more able he will be able to please me. And he can give us that peace. You see, Jesus was born to bring peace into your life in a degree and at a level that you never expected. And this morning, I just want to share with you three areas of peace that Jesus was born to give you. And they really start off with the foundation first. This is the first, the foundation. Without it, all of the other peace will be unstable. Then the next will be the next most important thing. And then the third is the top of the tree, if you wish. That may be the most visible, but it is really only there because of the foundation. So let's just jump in. Why was Jesus born? Well, Jesus was born to give me peace with God. He was born to give me peace with God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, the Bible says, in addition to everything else, we're happy because God sent our Lord Jesus Christ to make peace with us. Now, I think circle peace with us because here's one of the things that you need to understand. That before Jesus came into the world, there was no chance that man and God could be at peace. It didn't matter how religious they were. It didn't matter how many times they went to church. It didn't matter how many times they did what they thought was right because all of those were empty because that man at his weakness, at weakest, is not capable of living a sin-free life. And God is holy and he knows how damaging sin is and how dangerous sin is. And because of that, Unless our sins are taken care of, we cannot have a right relationship with God. We cannot be at peace with him. So when Jesus was born, he was born in order to live a life that displayed his love, how to live, but ultimately he was born to die. And the Bible says that he died in order to forgive our sins or to make it possible. You see, through the years, I've, I've, uh, I've been involved in marriage counseling with couples, and, 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 and I am always a little bit humored at how different the perspective can be between husbands and wives. Now, usually the men are worse than this than the women, but if there have been occasions to where the women has been just as, as ignorant in this regard as the men that I've, I've got with. 
There have been times whenever I, I've got together and, and I'll say, okay, guys, here's what I need you to do. And in this first assignment, I just need to know where you are on a one to 10 scale in your marriage. Where are you? One, you have zero satisfaction and you wish you were not in it. 10, you have absolute satisfaction and you think you can't imagine being without this relationship. And literally, and I've given different sort of, all of the ratings designed to sort of prove or, or see where they are. But what amazes me is that how many times the husband will put, I think we're at an eight. And the wife would put, I think we're at a two. And I can't tell you how many times the husbands are just like, what, what do you mean we're at a two? I thought this. And she goes, no, I've been trying to tell you all along. You've, not, you've just not been listening. And here's what I want you to know. As you look at Jesus coming into this world, he came so that you could have peace. But if you don't embrace Jesus as Lord, you need to know that there is no promise of peace for you, no promise of peace with God or any of the other resulting peace kind of areas that we're going to look at. And you may be thinking everything's okay with you and God. And you see, there are some benefits of living obliviously in a marriage relationship. Just, oh, I just thought everything was okay because it allows us to go on doing what we want to do without adjustment. But the danger is that you can lose something that's a lot more important to you than your simple your convenience or your ability to do what you want. And so in you, as you look at your relationship with God this morning, if you're here and you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, you need to know that you and God are not okay. And that doesn't ma mean, matter whether you are someone who attends and is a member of this church or someone who has never attended church before. God let, wants you to know that it is essential that you have a right relationship with him. And in order to do that, it took him coming into the world to deal with the problem between you and his, and that is the problem of sin. In, Rome, in Colossians chapter 1, the apostle Paul wrote these words. He says, God was pleased for him to make peace by sacrificing his blood on the cross. You used to be far from God. Your thoughts made you his enemies. You did evil things. But his son became a human and died, so God made peace with you. Now, he uses that word and circle the word enemy because when I say you're not okay with God, unless you're in a relationship with God to where he is your Lord and Savior, the Bible looks and says, you are my enemy. And you're going, well, I thought it was a God of love and I thought he was cared for me. And that is absolutely true, but he loves you enough to tell you the truth. God is holy and he can't stand sin. He knows how destructive it is both in this life and forever. And if you are embracing sin and doing what you want rather than embracing God and what he wants, then he wants you to know how dangerous you are to yourself and to those that are around you. You will do damage to people that you never meant to damage. You'll lead others to a place that you never imagined that you would lead them. And so he's just up front and he's saying, listen, you need to know we're not okay. We're enemies right now. But he goes on to say, but I don't want it to be that way. No matter how messed up you are, no matter who you are, the Bible says you're an enemy. And you may think of yourself as the most violent enemy in the world to God the way that you've lived. But Jesus says at Christmas, what I want you to know is that I know that you're my enemy, but that's not how I want the Christmas story to end. I wanted to end with you being my friend, but there's a problem. There's a problem in the way that you think. You have thoughts that are not in line with what I would want you to think. And because of your thought process, because you have not yielded your thoughts to me, you think things that are wrong, and because of that, you do things that are wrong. And here it says, your thoughts, that's why the, the, the thoughts of your mind have made you as enemies. And because of those thoughts, you did evil things. Now that word evil carries with it. When we say it in our, in our world, and I don't know if it's from, you know, for me, it's like, you know, with Dr. Evil and Jim Carrey or somebody, that when I think of evil, there's this diabolical kind of thing that I'm looking at. Like, oh, he's twisted and demented. But the word evil in Scripture doesn't have to do with a twisted, diabolical, sort of perverted person. But evil, by definition in Scripture, is anyone who does not surrender themselves to the teachings of Jesus in a way that they're obedient to them. Jesus, in his very 
biggest, most prominent sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, ended by saying, in the last day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And your name drive out demons and do a lot of good works. And I'll say, depart from me, you evildoers. Well, hold it. What do you mean evildoers? They're doing these good things. Why are they? Well, that word evildoers in the New American Standard is translated more literally. It's a better translation because it says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, again, if you want even a simpler translation, he says, I don't know who you are because you don't follow my law. You do what you want to do. And by definition, that's evil in God's vernacular. It's evil by example if you look in the world. If you could imagine those that are the most opposed to doing what God says, if you look in the newspapers, you will read those that are clearly defiant in their refusal to follow God because they're the most violent people that we have in our country. If you look at the time when your marriage fell apart, you will find out that it was evil. And I guarantee if your marriage fell apart, it was because one of you or both of you decided that doing what God really wanted didn't matter. And maybe one of you were defiant and going, I don't care what God says. And maybe the other, you were more subtle and you just prioritized in a way that said God doesn't matter. But the bottom line is it destroyed your marriage. For parents who have children, You want your kids to be right, and you want to make sure that they're saved. But if you're not living a life that is surrendered to the will of God, then you're focusing, then you're living not as workers of righteousness, but you're focusing, you're living as evildoers. And you can expect your children to be able to be blessed if they're not seeing an example of someone who is committed to doing what God wants. You see, it's a big deal that you understand that you're not okay. And this is, creates all kinds of problems in this life and ultimately in eternity because God doesn't want you to, no matter how twisted, even if you are that diabolical evil, God still wants to step in and say to you, I want to make a difference. I love you and I put something in you that's valuable. Please allow yourself to be at peace with me. You see... Sin destroys life here and for here and for eternity. And sin is simply the disregard of God's instruction and direction that shows up in the way you think and it shows up in the way that you live. And if this fundamental problem had not been addressed by God, there would be no chance that we would find peace with God. You see, we can't initiate it. All we can do is accept it. We don't perform well enough in order to where the slate is clean because of your performance. We, we perform because God performed for us in the sending of his son. In Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 10 through 10, the Bible says, God demonstrate, demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners, people who were unconcerned with pleasing God. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Jesus? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? He just says, Jesus came to save you. He came, and this this scene in the manger was that of a baby lamb that was born to be crucified, that was born to be sacrificed. And if he sent his son to give you the opportunity to have peace and be saved, when you didn't give a care about God, how much more do you think God is going to be able to bless you if you will commit to being someone who cares about pleasing God? You see, the most important peace isn't the one that we seek. So often you'll hear stories of people that go to jail. One of my, uh, my, one of my, my other sons, Marlon, he lived with us uh, growing up a, a lot. He was come from a very difficult background. His father was in and out of prison. He was my son's best friend. He lived in our house for, a, for, for uh, many years off and on. You know, three days here, four days here, two days gone. But, but he grew up around me. And right now, he's in prison because of the choices that he made to ignore what God had to say. The great news is that he is doing the best that this discipline that God has allowed him to endure has awoken awoken him, and he is doing better than I've ever seen him do. Now, if you are wise, you're going, oh, yeah, that's easy to say when he's in prison. There's a name for that. It's a jailhouse conversion. 
And if you talk with people who have been in prison, especially the guys that I've talked with who have been in prison and have been through, especially where I met many of them, was through a 12-step program, about half or three-fourths of them that I talked to said, yeah, when I made that commitment in prison, I didn't really do it because I was committing to Christ. I just wanted things to be better, and I thought it might get me out earlier if it looked like I was involved in church. That's why, I call it, that's why they call it a jailhouse conversion. But you see, they shoot for that, and you go, oh, that's just bad. But can I let you know, that's how a lot of us are in our relationship with God. You see, we have a problem in our marriage, and we want it to be better. And so we start going to church hoping that he'll cause peace in our marriage. Or we have problems with our children, and we don't know how to straighten them out, and they're going down a wrong path, so we decide, I'm gonna, I want to go to church, and I want to, God, will you give me this peace with my children? Or any relationship that's been fragmented. But the problem is, rather than really embracing Jesus as Lord, you're just not having a jailhouse conversion, but you're having a church house conversion. And the problem with those things is that for most, the overwhelming amount of prisoners that go through some kind of prison conversion, an overwhelming percentage of those, when they come out, forsake that. Because you see, the problem is while they were in, they went through the motions, but they never went through a genuine transformation of their mind. And the same thing happens for us at Christmas when we are at church. We come when there's a tragedy, wanting something better on the outside of our relationship, better with our wife, better with our kids, better with our parents, better with our job, better with them. But it's all about getting something, being at peace with them. But the problem is we're aiming for those things. And in aiming for those things, we miss getting them. Because you see, it's only when you have peace with God that you're going to be able to have peace in those other relationships. And you can shoot for peace with your family. You can shoot for just being emotionally satisfied, peace within yourself, and you can miss being or having a relationship with God completely. The music, the relationships will prop you up. But can I let you know when you shoot for peace with God, when you go, God, what matters most is that you and I are okay, that I've accepted this loving, gracious offer, all of those other things are naturally going to occur if at all possible. And the reason I say if at all possible, because sometimes Jesus lets us know that not everybody will want to be at peace with us. You see, all peace flows from peace with God, and I will not and cannot have the power from God if I don't make peace with God. You want things to be better all around you? Then you've got to get things right with God within your heart, within you. And Jesus came not only to allow that, but he came to facilitate that. Peace in my life starts with peace for God. And it's really the message of Christmas. That if we get no other gift than this one, the bottom line is that it's all worth it. The good news is that there are always other blessings that come from this relationship. You see, we get really bothered sometimes as, as, as religious people. I can't believe they've taken Christ out of Christmas. I can't believe we can't even say, well, can I let you know that sometimes we're a lot better at cursing the darkness than we are lighting the candle and saying, I don't care what they're doing. I'm going to make sure Christ is in Christmas. I'm going to make sure that I am letting people know that the most important thing, those in my family, my kids, my relatives, I'm going to let them know through my life and through my emphasis that the most important things this Christmas that they could ever do was have a relationship with Jesus because it will change everything. I want to point you to a little card stock, or it's not card stock, but a postcard piece of paper inside of your uh, bulletin this morning. And the reason I want to point this is that the crossings, we want to make sure that we give people a gift that will transcend the season. That if they get this down, then this will make a difference in all of us. So we do things to try to make sure that Christ is in Christmas. That when we give the gifts, that we bring the kids here to the church and the church members share with them the gifts, but they know that it's because of Jesus. That when we do our Christmas Eve service or or, or whenever the height service will be this year, we're not sure. But we do that because we want them to know that all the good things that people do with you through the year, it starts with Jesus. And Jesus may look like Chandler or Laura, but it's really Jesus that's causing this. So this Wednesday, just a week ago, we found out that there was going to be an opportunity to show a a streaming of a concert of one of our favorite artists that we'll be having here live at the Crossings during the month of April for our Easter concert. And it won't be here at this building. It will be at one of the high schools in the area. But his name is Andrew Peterson, and he's a great storyteller. 
It's a two-hour musical. And you see, some people don't even like, you know, they won't come to church, but for some reason they like music. I've had several people tell me that they gave this card to someone and they were like, man, I would love to come to that. Last week I talked with a lady and said, man, she was visiting. I said, I hope you enjoyed the service. She goes, I did, and said some, some nice complimentary things. I said, well, I hope you can come back. And we've got this streaming thing, and she had the card. And she goes, oh, I've got this in my purse. I'm going to be here for that. TC over at the Interval, our campus minister, said he's working, been working just like really hard with a couple of guys that he's been trying to get them to come to church or to cross chat or something. Hasn't got anywhere with them, and he invited them to this little musical, and they go, man, that is awesome. We're going to come to that. This Wednesday, we want to encourage anybody who wants to to show up here at the building at 7 o'clock. We will start at 7 because we're on their schedule with the streaming but we also want to challenge all of our members. In cell in your small group today, you will get four copies of this and make five, including the one that's in your bulletin. And over the next four days, we want to encourage you to invite five people to come to behold the Lamb. Why do that? Because we want people to know that the most important thing that they can get this year is understanding of how much God loved them in a relationship with Him. And if they get that relationship with him for all eternity, they will point back at Christmas 2017 as the greatest Christmas in their history. Jesus came to begin by giving us peace with God. Number two, Jesus was born to give us the peace, the peace of God. And what I mean by that is not only did he come to make us right, but he came to let us know that we can feel right with God an internal thing. You see, the, the peace with God is a transactional reality that I once was lost, but now I'm saved. I was blind, but now I see. But he doesn't just want us to know that on an intellectual, okay, I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He wants us to experience the feeling of peace that that brings inside. In Isaiah 26, 3, the Bible says, you, Lord, give perfect peace to those who keep their purpose firm and put their trust in you. He goes, man, just for those who, who understand their life in this world is to live to please God and they trust in you that you will keep them in a realm of peace that the world will never be able to experience. And it's not because everything's always going well. That wasn't a promise that Jesus made. The Prince of Peace came and lived a world that was difficult Yet he was always at peace to teach us that God came to give us an inner peace, the peace of God, and that peace shows up, first of all, even when I struggle. He goes, listen, you can have this peace even when I struggle. And Jesus said these words in John chapter 16. He said, I've told you all of this, and he's talking to his followers who are undergoing some things or about to go undergo some very difficult things. I've told you all this so that trusting me You'll be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace. In this godless world, you'll have to experience difficulties. But take heart, I've conquered the world. For anybody who hears the televangelist say that your life when you become a Christian is going to be peaceful and you'll not have no problems in this world, that if you're having problems with peace or you're having any struggles out there, it's because you're not being faithful as a believer. That's just a lie and opposes the truth of Scripture. But here is what Scripture says. You will suffer hardship, but in the middle of those, you will have a peace that overcomes that hardship. Every time I read this verse, I think about my dad a few years ago as he was passing away. And I was left in a discussion. I was his medical power of attorney and ultimately had to make the decision, I guess, and sign on the line, do we allow dad to live through a feeding tube or do we discontinue his dialysis and allow him to pass on in a week to 10 days at most? I knew exactly how my dad would want, so we made the decision, and everybody who knew my dad has always reiterated this to me. Your dad would have done, he would have been, he would have, you did exactly what your dad would want. Dad had had troubles with his cognitive abilities because some of the things that were going on, and I didn't think that it was fair that I turn off his dialysis, that we turn off his dialysis without him being exactly aware of what was going on. And so on two occasions, I talked to him, and I said, Dad, do, do, you, do you understand 
that we, we've turned off your dialysis. And he looked at me and said, yes, and I, I know that. I, I heard you guys, I, I know that. I said, Dad, well, do you understand what that means? And he goes, yeah, it means I'm not going to be around very long, am I? And I said, no, Dad, Dad, you're not. And I said, Dad, are you scared? It's a difficult thing to watch a parent die. It's a more difficult thing to watch them thinking they're afraid. Because I want to be there. And I don't know what I would have done. I don't know what I would have said exactly. But very quickly, my dad looked up in the eyes and looked me in the eyes and he said, Son, I have nothing to be scared of. The second time I asked him the same questions, he didn't say, I'm not afraid. He said, son, I know I'm not going to be here long. But he goes, before long, I'm going to get to see Jesus. I'm going to see my mom and my dad. And I'm all right with that. A peace that transcends the struggle. And I don't know what struggle that you're in involved right now. Maybe it's an emotional struggle with yourself. Maybe it's one that, a relational struggle. Maybe it's a health struggle, but you fought it and you realize, man, I just can't overcome this. Here's the thing that Jesus promised you is not that you will be healed or even that you will be reconciled, but that he can give you peace in the middle of that struggle. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul wrote and said, Never worry about anything, but in every situation let God know what you need in prayers and requests while giving thanks. He says, never worry about anything. That's a command. I'm going, okay, God, I'm a sinner because <laughs> I worry about stuff. He says, don't worry, but instead let God know what you need in prayers and requests. When, when, you're, when you're asking for stuff, make sure that you, you thank him for things because that's important. Then when I'm praying both with a desire to get something more and gratitude for what God has given me, then God's peace which goes behind anything we can imagine will guard your thoughts and emotions through Christ Jesus. You see, when you're going through difficult times, God understands that it is difficult for you. But here's the thing. He says, listen, those thoughts that you have in difficult times, they're going to get out of line. And the problem with your thoughts is that you are led by your thoughts. So if your thoughts get out of line, your life is going to get out of line. And he says, but not only your thoughts, but your thoughts and, what does he say there? your emotions. He says, listen, you know, God is going to give you your thoughts. And when you're, a, if you've ever watched your thoughts get out of line, you've watched yourself do some stuff. You're going, I can't believe I did that. If your thoughts and your emotions ever get out of line simultaneously, you have watched yourself do incredibly stupid things. Have you ever, after a situation, you've done something, you're going, man, I acted like an, I acted like an idiot. I, who was that? I don't normally act like that. If you have, and I have on many occasions, two things I guarantee you happen. You didn't guard your thoughts and you didn't guard your emotions. And when you don't guard those things, horrible things can happen. God says, here, let me help you with that. You pray, asking me for what you need telling me that you're grateful for what I've given. And I'll make sure that you're thinking right and I'll take care of the emotions for you and I will give you incredible peace in the middle of that. So there's peace when I struggle. It's the peace of God. But there's also peace when I sin. You see, struggle is that idea of things that are thrown upon me and I may have done nothing wrong, but the problem is a lot of our lack of peace comes from our own sin and our perception that somehow that we aren't forgiven. In 1 John Verse one, 1 John 1, verses 6 through 9, John wrote this and said, if we say we have a relationship with God and live in the dark, we're lying. He goes, listen, if you say that you're right with God, but you just live how you want to live, if you're every day, if you get up and say, okay, here's what I want to do and that's what you do, don't claim to have a relationship with God. You have a relationship with you. But he says, so let's just start off by saying there are people who live in rebellion to God. They do what they want to do. He says, so if you, if you say that, you, that you're, you, you have a relationship with God, but you're, you're walking in darkness, you're lying, we aren't being truthful. But for those who've embraced Jesus as Lord and Savior, we're not perfect, and we know that. And sometimes in our imperfections, we think that, man, I must not be right. He says, but if we live in the light, or literally if we walk in the light, 
in the way that God is in the light, we have a relationship with each other. And the blood of his son, Jesus, cleanses us from every sin. If we say we aren't sinful, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth's not in us. You see, he has two kinds of people that he says that are here. He has the one believer who says, oh, I'm a believer in Jesus. But when they plan their life and they plan their day, what comes out is what they want. When they make a decision about what they're going to do, where they're going to go, how they're going to act, ultimately, if they do what God wants, it's really more about it aligning with what they want. And he goes, listen, just be honest. Don't live in some stupid denial. Just go, I'm my own Lord. I do what I want. And he says, with that, you really shouldn't feel any confidence. But then he has another kind of believer who is saying, I'm really trying to be what God wants to. And because of that, they're even more sensitive to what's going on. And they're going, man, I made mistakes. I, God, I'm horrible. I'm no good. And he goes, no, let me talk to you for a second. If you're walking in God's light, and imagine that just as a spotlight. And walking a light in Scripture simply means that I am trying to live according to the teachings of Jesus because of my faith in him. It says, if you're walking the light as Jesus is in the light, then he says you have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus cleanses you. Now, for a moment, let me break that sort of analogy down. Now turn that spotlight because you know how light flows out from a spotlight. Now imagine that instead of that being a spotlight, it's a shower head. And you're walking in, the, in this shower that's there. It's a shower of grace. He says, as long as you're trying to please God, as long as you're walking by faith, trying to do him, you're not going to be perfect But the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. That word cleanses in the original language has one that most translations don't don't reveal. Some translations say, and the blood of Jesus Christ keeps on cleansing us. It's a linear action word. It means it continuously. And it doesn't mean I'm perfect because sometimes we think, well, if I'm walking the light, I won't sin. No, because after he says, if you're walking the light, you're cleansed. If you If you need cleanse, it means that you're still sinning, but you're not sinning out of choice. You're sinning out of weakness. And the mud is still on you, but the thing is, you're in the shower. And how long does the mud stick to you when you're in the shower? It doesn't. And he says, so here's what you know. In all your weakness, I love you and I forgive you. And you can feel good about who you are as you're walking towards me. I don't have to worry. If I die tonight, where would I go? Because Jesus had made sure that I'm forgiven. In Romans chapter 5, Paul said it like this, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, the more sin increases, the more grace God offers to deal with it. For some of you, you're in a period of time that it's easy for you in this life. And it's easy for you to do what's right. The choices are easy. Following Jesus is a stroll in the park on a sunny day. For some of you, it's a battle right now. You have people that you love who don't support you. It may be that you have a disease that makes you question. It may be whatever you fill in the blank that would make you go, I just don't know. And what you need to know, as you're trying to please God, God understands all of those difficulties. And as you continue to live righteously and try to do what's right, he goes, sometimes in a bad situation, even though you're mature, in those bad moments, I sin less than I would in the easy moments, right? That's just natural. Satan understood that. In the Old Testament, there was a guy named Job. And God wanted, he was a great follower of God. And Job came before, uh, Satan came before God and said, listen, yeah, Job's a great guy, but he's a great guy because he makes, you make it easy for him. Let me throw some hardship in there and see how, see how long he follows you. What Job was saying is that Satan knows that when you experience difficulty, you're more susceptible to behaviors that are wrong. What God wants you to know, that like Job, that even though your questions, even though your sin might increase in those moments, God says, listen, we're going to win this battle. You keep walking in that light and all your weakness and all my grace. I will forgive you and pardon you. And because of my love for you, my grace increases and you can be at peace. And it's an incredible thing to know that we're at peace with God as far as a relationship. And I'm at peace that no matter what happens. The struggles that I face, the sin that I fight, God says, keep walking. Keep growing, keep fighting, and I'll keep forgiving, and I'll keep empowering, and I'll keep blessing. So God came to give us peace with God, the peace of God, and then thirdly, peace with others. 
This last one is the one that brings us to Jesus more often than not. My relationship with God, whenever things, when I was a teenager, I thought I could do everything that I want to do, then I did a bunch of stupid stuff. And my dad, who I was closer to than any other human being, looked me in the eyes when I was 15 years old, almost 16, and said, I would rather be dead than have a son like you. Didn't yell, he was crying. It's the first time I ever saw my dad cry. And that destroyed relationship made me go, God, I got to do something about me. And I want you to know that God will do something about those relationships. If you'll do something about that first one, it has to be central. Peace with God is what brings the peace of God, and it enables you to be the kind of person who can live at peace with others. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, the Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. What he says is that if you're a peacemaker, you're going to be described as a children of God because God is the ultimate peacemaker. Jesus is described the prince of peace. Jesus, God is the king of peace. And in his children, we're going to be given both the power and the abilities to be people who can have peace in our relationship. You've tried everything in the world to save your marriage, to be a good husband. Everything but Jesus is your Lord. For some of you, you've tried a billion ways to lead your children and try to get it through their heads other than just your, first of all, submitting to Jesus. But here's what you need to know. If you, if I accept Christ Jesus as Lord, you see, a lot of times we, we, we embrace him as Savior. And that's a misnomer because you can't embrace him as Savior and not Lord in Scripture. Lord is who he is when he comes in. He is announced as the Lord. And it is that lordship, whenever I submit to him as Lord, that he is able to save the relationships that are at all savable around me. When I embrace Jesus as Lord, and what I mean by that, I'm not just going to say, Jesus, get me out of this, but I'm saying, Jesus, help me be whatever you want me to be, that all of a sudden, when I embrace him as Lord, it gives me the ability to live well among others. Christ the Lord provides the instruction and that instruction, when submitted to him, submitted to him by someone who has embraced him as Lord, allow him to work in my life, in my marriage, in my kids, in my relationships. Forty years ago, over 40 years ago, I made a commitment to my wife. There's no reason we should still be married with a background of sexual abuse, with a background of being someone who is married when they're 17 years old. There is zero reason we should still be married. Zero reason from the surface. But both of us, when we made that commitment, especially me, because how messed up I was, I knew that if I am in control of this relationship, I will destroy it. When my first child, when I found out that, he was, that, he, that she was pregnant, didn't know boy or girl, I remember the first thought, the first words out of my mouth and through my head were, I have got to be a better man. And I knew that wasn't about me performing, it was about me submitting to God. So my marriage commitment to, to Rita was before there was any commitment to Rita was I am going to be a servant of Jesus. He is not going to be my advisor. He is going to be my Lord. I'm not just asking him for a, what are you, I am going to ask in view of doing. And there are times in marriage to where we know what God wants us to do, but there are times when, you know, that honeymoon period is over. You know, have you ever been in that relationship with your, your husband or wife? How many of you have ever been here in your relationship with your husband or wife? So where, quite frankly, when you look at him, you don't really love him in the morning at the moment. You don't even like him at that moment. Raise your hand for just a second, okay? So I'm going to see how many liars we have in the church, okay? A bunch of them. It's obvious, okay? Who has been married more than a week in here? Raise your hand. Okay, that's how many of you looked at your mate and said, I can't stand you right now, or thought it. You are a sinner too, okay? You lied. And there were those times when I'm like, God, I'm supposed to love her like Christ loved the church. And I'm going, I don't. And, I can't. and yet, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. And I decided that I would trust what he said rather than what I feel. And understand, that was never carried out in perfection in my life as far as how it came out. The forgiveness and the ability to say I was wrong and to do the things that I need to, or the ability to stand up and be kind and gentle as I confronted her, none of that was easy for me, but it was the very heart of my commitment to God and what I knew was essential if that marriage was going to make it. Forty-something years later, I love her more now than I've ever loved her. 
Our relationship is better than it's ever been. And the great news for you today is not that somehow Robert and Rita, you know, they just happen to marry the right person. No, the truth is we just committed to the right person. And that was neither of us. Because when those commitments to her or those commitments to me are made, they're made on a stage where everything's good. My commitment to Jesus came because he committed to me when everything was bad. And he loves me and he trusts me. He loves me and I trust him. On your notes, there's a passage of Scripture out of James chapter 3 where the Bible says this, the wisdom that comes from heaven is pure. That's the most important thing about it. And it's not about, and, and that's not all. It also loves peace. It thinks about others. It obeys. It's full of mercy and good fruit. It, it, it's fair. It doesn't pretend to be what it's not. If you're wise, that's what you're going to be. Then notice what he says in verse 18. Those who make peace should plant peace like a seed. If they do, it will produce a crop of right living. I wouldn't even know what to plant. I wouldn't know how to dig. I wouldn't know how to water if it wasn't for Jesus. But here's the thing he says is, if you will follow Jesus and choose to plant the seeds that he has you plant, plant it will come out with a harvest of peace and right living. So maybe this morning you're going, man, how do I experience that peace for myself? That sounds good theoretically that I can have this kind of peace with God, peace of God to where no matter what's going on, I can, I can be at peace and peace with others. How do I get that? Well, here's the bottom line. You get it by trusting Jesus, but not on some superficial level. Let me read you a passage of Scripture where Jesus was talking to a group of people who talked about following him. You never hear this read at altar calls. It is rare if somebody sits down and studies the Bible that they will ever look at this passage, and it's just kind of strange because it's the one where Jesus himself says, here's what you need to think about before you commit to me. He uses an illustration. He says, suppose a king is going out to war against another king. He would first sit down and think things through. He would count the cost, he's saying. Can he and his 10,000 soldiers fight against a king with 20,000 soldiers? In this story, you are the king with 10,000 soldiers, and God is the king with 20,000, and there is zero chance that you're going to be able to win. You can fix, you can shake your fist at God, you can be as defiant as you want, but ultimately the Bible says every knee will bow to Jesus. The question is, will you bow in time for him to do something good in your life? Verse 32 says, if he can't, that king with 10,000, he'll send ambassadors to ask for terms of peace. So here we get to know, what are the terms of peace for you to have, be at peace, to have the peace of God in your life and to be at peace with God? Jesus says, in the same way that that king would find peace, none of you can be my followers. That's what the word disciple means. None of you can be my disciples unless you give up everything. Here's how you get that peace. Here's how you get peace with God. Here's how you get the peace of God. Here's how you learn to have peace with others. You surrender completely. God, I give up. I'm going to let you control my life. Now you're going, well, but surrender, why surrender? Here's why, because I trust Jesus to be my king. It's all about who you trust. Every pursuit that pulls you away from God says that you trust God more than you, that you trust you more than you trust God. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says this. Since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Christ Jesus, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Isaiah 54, 10 is not on your notes, says this, The mountains and hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end. I will forever keep my promise of peace. So says the Lord who loves you. This morning, you can have the peace of God if you're here this morning and you have never made a relationship with God a priority. You can have that peace. If you're here and you have surrendered to Jesus and yet somehow that peace is elusive and you've not been able to hang on to it, you can have that peace this morning, but it is going to involve trusting him enough to where you surrender yourself. Inside of your worship bulletin this morning, there's a little cardstock piece of paper. 
It's on a fourth of a piece of paper this size. Let me encourage you to pull that out as I pray. Would you bow with me? Father, right now I'm praying that uh, every member and every guest will pull out that little communication card. Father, they can recognize it by on one side it will say the problems of life where the problems of life meet the power of God. On the other side is a chance for them to do something this morning to connect with you. Father, you've reached down for us. And Father, we would have never been able to reach you. We would never have been able to deserve that, Father, if it had not been for that. But in your grace, you don't force a relationship on us, but you ask us to seek you and to reach back. And Father, this card is that opportunity to do that. Father, there are people here this morning who've never had a relationship with you. And Father, because of that, they'll never be able to experience the peace that matters most, nor the peace that they long to experience internally or relationally. Father, for those who don't know, they go, I don't even know where to start with this. Father, help them just to write on that card their name, their address, and check, I'd like a personal Bible study. Because it's through trust that we surrender to you. And Romans 10 says it's through hearing the message that someone shares with us that we develop that trust. So, Father, somebody, whether a friend or somebody who lives in their neighborhood, will set up, show, show them what it means to trust Jesus and what it means to be a follower of his. For others, there are people who just need to say, I want to be baptized. They've not done that. They got to a point of the study, and they said, oh, I'm going to stop here because I didn't know that, that becoming a Christian meant surrendering my life to Jesus, giving everything up. I didn't know that. But when they studied the Scripture, it was clear, and they still don't trust you, Father. They think their way is better. Father, help them to know that you and they are not okay. Father, help them to understand that they have poised themselves and positioned themselves as enemies. And you want them to know that just because whenever everything begins to decay in their life, they will know that it's because they ignored you and your desire to be a friend. Father, I pray that right now they'll know that and they'll just check, I'd like to be baptized. Because in Scripture, that's that point of faithful surrender to where we give up our control of our life because we trust you. And because of that, you forgive our sins. You fill us with your spirit. You add us to your church. You set us apart for an incredible work. Father, for others this morning, there are specific things that, Father, just that, that destroy their peace. They've been abused. They've been divorced. And they, God, they, they don't, they've got questions but no answers. But we have people who have been through that that can give answers to those questions. And in finding those answers, it doesn't mean that everything that happened was good. It does mean that, Father, in finding those answers, they can be at peace. And they can be people who help others find peace. So as our worship team sings this first song, God, I pray that they'll fill out that card. When the baskets are passed during a second song for our members, they'll drop in that card saying, God, I want to be better and they'll give that card and their faithful commitment along with their, with their generous offering. Father, our members have committed to that, and we have to have that to keep the church running. For our guests, we ask them not to give money. We're not superior. Our money's not better. We just want to give them a clearer view of you. And God, I pray that we help them to overcome their fear.